play with anger and compliance in this thing for a minute. I, I kind of breezed through this last time a little bit, but let me just illustrate a point that I did a little bit. On a geologic map, it's important to realize that unconformities can have different patterns on a geologic map. So for example, this contact here between Mississippian rocks and Cambrian rocks is an unconformity. But the, the contact between different rock units, or the depth of even, this, that contact, which is parallel to the other depositional contact, hence it's a disconformity, and you can't tell that pattern on an outcrop or on a geologic map other than the fact that these rocks are of different age than those rocks. That's a true challenge on things like Precambrian rocks, where you may not know the age of those rocks, and then things like disconformities can be difficult to recognize. And for when we go on the field class, I'll show you an example of something like that, where people later learn an example of that, how, how dramatically different the the, the contact relationships might be with these things. And here's the other alternative. This is fairly subtle on this particular map, but you can see these con these are pre-Cambrian sedimentary rocks. If you follow that contact up, it gets truncated at that position. And that's because this is the annular unconformity. So that contact ends at the unconformity because that's the, the truncation between those different rock units. So that subtlety on a geologic map can be important in that in that context. And I think that was what I glossed over last time. So the third type of contact that we didn't quite get, we saw this in the field, but I wanted to spend just a couple of few minutes to review this, uh, is intrusive contacts. It's the third of the primary types of igneous contacts. And there are two different kinds. We, we'll discuss here discordant intrusions and concordant intrusions. They have a difference because they can, one is straightforward, the other is not. And the straightforwardness can be confusing in, in a certain context. So I'll get to that as we go along. The, the first type are all these terms you learn in probably processes or, or intro, things like stock, slug, and basalt, all those different terms that apply to large bodies of, of magmatic rock. The second type are crater wall intrusions, and those have two simple names, dikes and sills, right? Now the importance of the reason I talk about dikes and sills is that Dikes are characterized by two approximately dikes and sills. Both have a characteristic where they have a two, they have a parallel walled intrusion. There I said it right. But it's important to note that when you put, when you have this relationship where dikes come into another rock, it doesn't matter what the, that rock is, uh, or sills come into a rock, they impart a pseudo layering in the rock such that that layering can look like something else. The best example of that is illustrated here in the case of a granitoid intrusion that's cut by mafic dikes. That in part, that produces an effect in which there's compositional layering that's generated in the rock that's, a, that's produced because this rock invades that rock. There's a history here that this rock is younger than that by cross-cutting relationship. But think what would happen to this rock if it got all twisted up, such that it got smeared out and deformed. Uh, it could be very difficult to know that those intrusions are intrusions. You might think that it was an original sedimentary material or something of that sort. And it can be very, very difficult to tell the difference. So just a word of warning about what can happen when rocks get deeply buried and things like that of these kind of processes. The other kind of intrusion, this is a terrible picture, but the best one I have with this sort of thing. Here is an, an intrusive body. There, it's, these are darker rocks on this side and lighter rocks on this side. Uh, I wouldn't just hit the button and go to this one. There's that, what that contact looks like. Hmm. Trace that out. Uh, that isn't exactly planar. Uh, and therein lies the problem with other types of intrusions, these so-called discordant intrusions. Large granitic bodies almost always have this contact relationship in which there's highly irregular contacts that form along the bottom. They shoot dikes out into the surrounding country rock, uh, and the contact itself tends to be highly irregular. Uh, it's variable, 
the different structural levels, what granitoids look like. But the bottom line in terms of, of primary contact relationship is if you want to make any kind of prediction about what a contact what looks like, that looks like, you are just crazy. Uh, <laughs> because it's unlikely it's going to obey any rules in the family. It, it's a major reason why things like economic mineral deposits are often very difficult to evaluate because oftentimes economic mineral deposits are associated with, with that intrusions one. of some sort. And it's very difficult to predict where contacts go. Uh, so they just drill the hell out of it and uh, <laughs> try to figure out where, what the geometry is. But in, real, in reality, you can see it's just complicated. And how much of it gets dispersed hydrothermally as well. well yeah, well, that's a whole different story about what's the surrounding rock. But that's a different issue. And beyond the, what we need to worry about here, that's economic geology. Uh, but the, the key the conclusion comes out like that's a little uh, <laughs> primary boundaries of igneous rocks can be planar in the case of dikes and sills and in the case of sills when they are concordant to other layering then they are just accentuating the existing pseudo or the stratigraphy of the rock but it's important to understand that those rocks then if you do have sills in a complex and they no longer obey uh, superposition, because then the, the, the intrusive sheets are younger than the rocks that they're in, which is completely shuffles the deck in terms of chronology. It's an important problem, again, when rocks get deformed, because that could be very confusing. If you think the rocks are volcanic, say, instead of intrusive, uh, you can completely misinterpret the chronology in the sequencing. Uh, there are highly irregular plutons, or distorted plutons, and just no predicting where things are going. Uh, an important thing that I didn't emphasize yet is that rocks, igneous rocks, typically carry no information about paleo-horizontal, which often confuses paleomagnetists who have done some very bad studies in the past because of that in assuming certain things about paleo-horizontal, which are bad assumptions when you're looking at, say, granitoids of some sort. But it's an important concept. There's no paleo-horizontal. Uh, you can take a guess, but it's going to be a real guess. The good news is, is oftentimes dikes are sort of predictable, and we'll come back to that a little bit later after we talk a little bit more about some theoretical things, particularly as many of them are vertical or horizontal. Uh, but it's, it's a question of where you are. Okay, so in geology, those are that's just, that's the four, third type of primary igneous con or, or primary contact in a rock body. So there are depositional contacts, unconformities, of which there are three different subtypes, and then there are intrusive contacts. These are planar originally. These are planar at least on one side, uh, whereas these can be planar, but they're typically irregular as hell, and so they have no predictability. So that's an important primary relationship to keep in mind. On standard geologic maps, these are usually shown as thin black lines, all of them. Uh, but today, these days, I think it's very important. There's no reason why you should do that. So like when you start to do mapping techniques, it's easier to show them as three different colors and differentiate them as three different types of line work. Uh, important point of this, and by the bottom line of all this, is even if you got complicated, distorted rocks like this thing, uh, an important issue is that you might be able to assume that some layer like that started off as a primary flat line sedimentary bed. On the other hand, of course, it could also be a dike that's been folded. But that's another story. We can get to the details of that kind of rock. But normally, if you have rocks that are clearly metasedimentary, you can make that particular assumption. Other things get more complicated because they inherit their uh, initial primary relationship. Now, the, the last point of this sort of preliminary stuff is to realize that all, the, all of these three types of of contacts that occur on geologic maps are primary features of the rock. And we use those as a starting dish for everything we do in structural geology. And structure is about the three Fs. I think I said this a few times already. But those that includes faults, folds, and fabrics. Uh, and we'll talk about all of those as we go through this particular class. Here's examples of the three Fs, right? Fabrics, well, let's do the simpler ones first. There's a fault where materials are simply displaced by motion on a, on a <coughs> planar discontinuity. Folding, where layers are worked around 
you can make a larger scale feature. And then there are, here's the more complicated fold, but the third type of structures that we'll talk about here are fabrics. And here's an example, if you can see this here, these objects have been distorted or stretched out, like pull a piece of bubble gum or something of that particular sort, where the rocks are just drawn out by flow, or solid state flow within the material. This occurs during metamorph, these occur during metamorphism. These occur in more near surface environments. And you have these different kinds of things. And we'll talk about the significance of that as we go along. Now we did this in the field, so I'll, I'll answer this quickly. Which of those three produces a fourth type of lithologic contact by a geologic man? Fault. Fault, correct. And the reason for that is here's an illustration of that. The faults, just like we saw in the field example, units come up the faults and, can, and get truncated. So if you look at the other depositional contacts that occur along here, they come up with a fault and get truncated, or these here get truncated at, at that particular <laughs> position. So it makes a new lithologic contact. It will separate that rock body from that rock body. And that's a very conspicuous thing that can be recognized on, a, on any geologic map. Faults, by the way, are always shown on a traditional geologic map as a heavy black line. So about twice the line weight of the standard deposition or intrusive or unconfirmed contact. Uh, so you can, if you look at a map, you can always, and there's a specific symbology that we'll come back to when we talk about faults. Um, so just as a quick summary of this whole thing that I was supposed to say in the last time, but I got behind. Uh, <laughs> I'm already behind this, but I'm not good. Um, that there basically are four <coughs> types of, of contact among rock bodies that we're going to deal with in this class, right? The three primary types that we just talked about, and the third, fourth type is a fault. Burn that in your head, because that's one of my standard questions I always ask. And because it's important to keep that in mind, because that's the basic building blocks of the geologic map. So faults are the only ones that make that contact relationship. It, what confuses people often about this is other type, there are other types of structures, folds and fabrics, but they do not distort or they do not modify the basic original contact within the rock body. So in other words, you fold rock, the original primary layers are still there. They aren't, they aren't stuck against something else. Uh, whereas, all, all, whereas the others, uh, or else, no, the faults are the only ones that distort them. If you make just draw things out and make taffy out of them, you still you still retain the basic geometry. Or if you bit warp them around, you still have the contacts are present. You don't you don't uh, displace things and move one rock against another. That's a critical point that we'll get to when we talk about recognizing faults, say versus folding, is that basic relationship. So sort of a general goal of of we're going to do in this class, we always can look at what these, we're going to try and describe all those three kinds of structures. We've done that a little bit on the first field trip. We'll do more on this next field trip on Friday. Uh, our, but beyond that, this is just recognizing geometry. The secondary goal is to recognize kinematics of how things move, and that's going to be our first topic that we deal with in some detail. And then ideally, we might want to know the dynamics of the processes or the forces that produce a given set of uh, rock bodies. Each of those gets successively more complex. Although theoretically, interestingly, this one is easier to do, even though conceptually this one is easier to do, but we'll see as we go along. Okay, one last sort of preliminary thing that I want to go through, partly because so we can deal with some of this, is I want to talk about a little bit about maps and geology, geologic mapping is an important basis for this. This class is really kind of directly interwoven with the, the field class. And so that's one of the reasons the field class directly follows this class is you could, get a, you could build on the geometric analysis techniques you learn in this class in, in field geology. Because field geology is, an, is a synthesis of smaller observations to larger observations, which you're going to get practice in in this class, but not as much as you do in the field class. But it, we're going to spend a lot of time on maps in this class. And there's some basic geography that everybody needs to know about maps that I've learned over the years, but not everybody knows. And these people are, you know, between being protractor challenged and, and spatially challenged, it's, it's 
there are certain things that you need to keep in mind. You guys are not as bad as when I used to live in New Orleans. Um, anybody ever been to New Orleans? You, you ever by the Mississippi River Bridge? By the West Bank of the Mississippi? The yeah, across the, the bridge to the West Bank of the Mississippi? Yeah. What direction do you go to get to the West Bank of the Mississippi? Great easy. <laughs> People in New Orleans were always amazingly directionally chill because they had no idea what direction. It was so flat, there was no spatial reference. And the river loops around, so to go to the West Bank, you go east. So we had no clue what east, west, north, and south were, right? Um, you guys at least are better at that. But, well, but there are still issues that are important to bear in mind when you deal with uh, geologic map and base mapping. And I also want to emphasize to you how this is evolving, such that your career is just going to be completely different than what I dealt with. And that's what the purpose of this last 15 minutes or so of this particular discussion. Uh, here's examples of some of basic geologic maps. Here's a geologic map with no base. Here's a topographic map that would lie underneath this. And here's an aerial photograph. Those are the classic traditional objects that are used in the construction of a geologic map, a topographic base and an aerial photograph. Commonly, that aerial photograph has a stereo pair where you could look at the at in three dimensions with the with but with uh, stereo glasses and get a feel for the common between this topo topography to that stereo photography. In the traditional way that was always done is you have a set of aerial photo photographs, you've got a map, and then you've got and you're mapping on that topographic base, going back and forth between those two different features. 99% of all geologic maps that exist today were done that way in some particular sense. That won't happen much longer. Uh, but what you get out of that is that this traditional kind of geologic map, which has underneath it, you can see topographic contours sitting underneath here, which is an illustration of the topographic features on the surface of the Earth, various uh, geographic elements like rivers and the like that run through it. But then superimposed on it are the geologic contacts. So here are depositional contacts between this rock unit and that rock unit. There's another one there. Here are these symbologies we talked about in the field, dashed lines versus solid lines. This guy was pretty confident, considering this is all wood. <coughs> I don't think I'd call most of those solid lines, but you know, people are different with things like that. And then here's faults shown as heavy lines. And there are other symbology, like an actual trace of a fold, and we'll deal with that as we go on. But all of those are the basic building blocks of a, of a geologic map, all these different components. But there's under, fundamentally, it's an underlying base map and the geology plotted on top of it. And that combination is, is the intersection of geologic features or geologic bodies with the surface of the Earth projected onto a flat map topology. Uh, so everything is flat map based on an XY coordinate system, not XYZ, and we'll deal with that in a minute. So to summarize, those components then are a base map, which is just your geographic reference. And you should note that even topographic maps, by the way, historically for geology, did not even exist until about the 1950s. Uh, geologists used to make their own topographic maps by surveying, which was really tedious. Uh, but uh, that base map lies on, is the system on which you do your, your mapping. The line work is all those primary and secondary features, right, that we just talked about. Depositional contacts, unconformities, faults, and various geologic symbols. There are colored units that represent the rock bodies or the different rock units. And then there are various symbols. And I'm going to set up a thing. I'm hoping to do this online so you should know all these various geologic symbols for strikes and dips and things like that. And I will put that up somewhere. At least we'll go over it and give you some kind of a quiz over, over what that symbology is. But a, a map also always carries a scale and a north arrow. And there's an explanation that describes the elements. Of it. You'll burn this in your head when you do the field class, where you will pound on you that all this stuff belongs on a geologic map. But those are basically the components that make up a geologic map. Here's this flat map statement. We've known since the 15th century that the world was round, right? But we still make flat maps. That's because 
for all intents and purposes, flat at the scale we live at. Uh, and if, that's fine if you're in Kansas, but uh, in the real world, we're, especially in places like out here where we have mountains, a flat map is a 2D representation <coughs> of a 3D world. So there's an abstraction of the, of the 3D world that's the topographic base that's typically what you look at. You can look at aerial photographs and you get a feel for that topography, but it's not the real three-dimensional surface. And you always have to keep that in mind uh, when you think about what a map is. I think that it comes in here later, but I'll say it again now. It's always important to remember that a, that a flat map based system is always XY, Z, XY is your spatial position XY, and Z is always projected onto that surface. So if you're on a cliff, and you're on the top of the cliff, the top and the bottom of the cliff are in the same position XY on that map. So a cliff in the representation on a, on a flat map data structure is nothing, it's a line. Right? You have a gazillion different things on a cliff face, and they won't show up on the map because they're just a single line. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weakness of the flat map data structure, but we'll get to that in a moment. We are transitioning into something new, though, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to get to. Uh, the traditional base maps that are used in geology are topographic maps. We've been introduced to this, and we'll go through it some more. Vertical aerial photography, which is taken from an aircraft. Nowadays, often orthocorrected. Which, and all orthocorrection is, I said this in the field br briefly, but orthocorrection is simply to remove what's called parallax, what allows you to see 3D with, with a, a cam a, a, one photograph was taken here or here with an airplane, one sits on each eye, and it's like you have eyes 100 meters apart looking down, and you can see the stereo view of the, of the ground surface. That's actually how all topographic maps were made, by the way, is that particular method, just flying, taking advantage <coughs> of that trigonometry and, uh, and getting position from that. Uh, but remember that a, 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 a standard aerial photograph is not a map, because it's distorted. That's why you can see stereo from it. So you can't just map on an air photo, although these days you could re-reference it and it wouldn't be a big deal. Uh, there are oblique aerial photographs, or oblique photographs in general, uh, which are even more distorted. They're satellite imagery, radar imagery, <coughs> digital elevation models, and nowadays you can even do other kinds of things that are custom smaller scale things, which I think are going to become even more important as we go into mm -hmm. the time here. Uh, again, to so total maps remain the standard that we use, but I really don't think they're going to be around that long. I think within a decade they'll be gone. Uh, the very near future, everything will probably be on a XYZ grid of some sort, a Google Earth kind of mm -hmm. view of the real world. Uh, and the data sources for those are, are changing also rapidly. The data sources, the, the basic one we use now comes from a shuttle radar mission that was done one years ago, uh, which would use radar, and it has a resolution of about 30 meters in most cases. You can squeak it down to about 10, but if you're north or south of 60, you can't use that. The sub shuttle didn't fly that far north or south. Uh, <coughs> higher resolution terrain models can be obtained from the airborne LIDAR is one system. Anybody know what LIDAR means? I had to learn it. I think it's light. Uh, intense digital area something and rangy <laughs> I should have written it down but it's it's basically uses a laser but a laser scans scans the ground or it's actually any light lidar system scans a laser that uses the return from the from that signal knows the distance to remarkable precision like millimeters uh, mm -hmm. and so if you have, if you fly that system and scan the ground, you get a very high resolution terrain model. Uh, they, they are both airborne, and you can do this grounded. There are also ground-based systems where you just set something up and scan the area. That's how you get these cool models of various things. And, e and more, even more recently, you can have a poor man's version of that, and I'll show you an example of that in a moment, of using photos 
you can use sort of the same method they used as the analog methods of making topographic maps can now be used to make three-dimensional models of features. Uh, so that's why I say within a decade, I think, that that's all you're going to see is three-dimensional models of any of this. But meanwhile, we're still going to have to mess around with topo maps for a while. And so I'm going to, it's also an interesting way to learn various three-dimensional visualization techniques. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to kind of skip through this a little bit. Fred, you can read this later. Uh, other bases are aerial photography, and these are particularly useful these days because you can almost anywhere, certainly in the US, but almost everywhere in the world, obtain orthocorrect <coughs> photography at high resolution. Most of them are actually satellite imagery. Uh, in orthophotography, that parallax effect is, re is removed. And the beauty of ortho, if you want to stick with a flat map, data structure, the important thing about orthophotography is you can map right on the orthophotograph. We saw that, I handed you one of those in the field on last Friday, which is, is simply an orthocorrected aerial photograph. Uh, and some of them have ridiculously high resolutions, like two 20 centimeters or so, right? Uh, and uh, 20 centimeters, I don't know, anyway. But ridiculous resolution. It's routine now to get one meter. You can download anywhere in the US one meter resolution uh, orthophotography. Uh, and a lot of places have half meter or less. Uh, the beauty of orthophotographs is they have a lot of flexibility. So you can drape them onto train models. And you, then you already, that's what Google Earth does basically, is it uses a digital elevation model and drapes ortho imagery onto that terrain model. Uh, the problem, of course, in part of this stuff is that with a lower resolution elevation model, then you can't quite see all the subtleties that you might see in front of you in a terrain model. But we'll get to that. I think that'll go away soon, too. Uh, satellite imagery is, is actually the basis of a lot of what is used now. A lot of this ridiculously high. In the past, your friend and ours, the DOD, would not allow uh, scientists to have uh, satellite imagery that was better than 10 meter resolution. And in fact, for a long time, it was 20 meter resolution. Uh, and they did that because of, you know, they didn't want people basically to have free by satellite data, right? Uh, but of course, now commercial satellites fly with 20 centimeter resolution. So, it, you know, anybody can buy imagery, whatever they want. You don't have to be in the DOD. Uh, and so now it's no longer classified, and it's revolutionized what you can see out there. You, that some of that stuff we've been using, with the stuff we used on Friday was satellite imagery. Uh, they just had a new satellite go up that's even better. But yeah, there's, they, they just keep getting better and better. There's a limit, of course, to what you can see through the atmosphere, but that's another issue. Uh, but a lot of this stuff is so widely available now that it's just you got it's just ridiculous amount of material you have available. There's only just recently become available. There are also radar imagery, which is something you may or may not have become aware of, can be extremely useful in really remote settings, especially where there's no other terrain and where there's ridiculous amounts of vegetation, because radar can see through the vegetation. And those are sometimes also used, but you have to be in jungle and things like that to, to deal with that kind of stuff. Uh, today, there's increasing use of what are essentially homemade maps, because you can do this with things like GPS, or other high resolution techniques, anything from just simply following things and getting a three dimensional view with GPS to laser ranging devices, which are nothing more than the same thing that LIDAR technology is using, or do the same thing and you just collect your own high resolution photography. I'll show you what I mean by that in just a minute. Uh, it's really important to understand that here's a, I, I said this already once, but I'll drive it back again. It's a 3D world, but most maps are a 2D representation of that 3D world. Orthophotography, satellite imagery draped on terrain, is, is a two-dimensional view of the three-dimensional world, which is very, very limiting. And that's why I'm convinced that it's not going to last much longer when there's no reason for it, really. Uh, but it's very confusing to most people if you haven't dealt with this, to, just to remember that it's very important to understand that every position on a flat map 
is projected from its third dimensional position. So if you just drop a plumb bob from your position at any given point on a map, right, it would lie on the position on the, on the shrunk version of what you're seeing. And it doesn't project down slope or something like that. It's important to understand that it's always projected straight down. Uh, and that when we'll, we'll exploit that, that's a useful in some respects for doing kinds of calculations, but it's not very good in the context of visualizing three dimensions. So for example, the thing we're gonna do on Friday that will be an illustration of that, a lot of these wiggly lines you see here, some of those are real in the sense that they're related to, to structure in the rock, or curvature in the rock, but some of them, like those lines right there, are, are wiggly because of terrain, not because of uh, structure. And the distinction between what structure and what terrain becomes a tricky problem. And I said a little bit of this in the field the other day, but we'll really see it on Friday even more, <coughs> is that the intersect, the topographic features on the surface of the Earth are complex. And when you have a complicated geometry that intersects that, you can have an infinite number of ways that that, that can be manifest on a flat map outcrop pattern. And one of those, one of the simplest is this squiggly line. And the good news is this, this kind of squiggly line thing is very predictable. And that's what we'll deal with on Friday out in the field. That's the first basic tool you need to learn. Uh, it's, it is important to realize that it, in your careers, this is all, you won't even bother I'm sure with topographic maps, but you do need, you need to know what you mean. Uh, and we might even get to the stage of doing 4D wizardry, which means 3D in time, right? Uh, we aren't even close to that yet. We're having trouble with this. Uh, really? But we're getting there. Uh, it's the problem, well, the real problem, I'll tell you what, the problem with 3D visualization for geologic structure is the ability to, to show the penetration of the features into the ground or into the air as a visualization of the actual geologic structure. Not just easy to show the terrain model and the geology or the, the, the material draped on that terrain, but it's not so easy to, to illustrate. It's, it's, the, it's taking a cross section and complicating the problem by an order of magnitude. Uh, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, this is just for fun. This is, this is a, if you want to go look at this website, this is one that we started putting together here for some of the stuff we were doing here, actually. But uh, <coughs> I just wanted to show you this as an illustration of one example. So you can go through that website and see some examples of some stuff that's just a, how did that go away? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah, they're trying to sell you something. Uh, there's some BS here that I put down. Uh, <laughs> but what I wanted to really show you was here's a classic here's a classic illustration of one of our problems we run into geology that relates to this issue about three dimensions. Here's a picture of an outcrop. When you look at that view of that outcrop, I know what it looks like, but I'll bet you have no clue what that looks like in three dimensions. Like, can you tell me whether there are bumps or anything on this? Or is it flat? I can't tell, can you? This is also three dimensional in the sense that there's another side. Mm -hmm. right? If you go back on the other side of this, there's more to this particular outcrop. It's wild, right? Look at the, how these rocks, this rock has the swirlies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a marble. Uh, but look at it down over here. Here's what the other side of it looks like. Okay. Uh -huh. So some very cool little folds here. Look how this one makes Synchro. a circle. That also is kind of confusing because you still have two-dimensional view. You can't quite figure out what that looks like, right? Uh, but the good news is in the modern world, you can do, here's an illustration of something. You can just take a bunch of photographs of that thing. From different directions. Some of you have probably seen this. It's like people take pictures of the Statue of Liberty, right? And create a three dimensional model. It's very easy to do this. Mm -hmm. You can do that, and you can make 
three-dimensional model. I didn't bring funny glasses. But if you get the funny anaglyph glasses, you can visualize this in stereo. Or uh, here it is. This, this is a different view of it. This is reconstructed from the model, not reconstructed from. This isn't a real picture. This is like a pseudo bird's eye view of that outcrop. But I wasn't able to do that. I was just able to hold my camera up and take pictures. But you can see here there was that compass we had a picture of. Here's the back side of the outside crop, front side of the outcrop. By doing this, you already start to see one thing. I asked whether there was any bumps. bumps. Edges. This is actually, you can start to see that this is actually a bump, right? And it's not just a flat surface. Uh, you could slightly tell because of the orientation of the compass, but you all, couldn't. Yeah. But if you really want to see that, I'll see if my YouTube video runs. This is hard to see by you don't see the manipulator itself, but you start to see what this looks like as you turn this, right? You can see the back side of the outcrop. Mm -hmm. Now you can see this is the top. That's also because it's shaded. There's that bump. And you can see other parts of it now because it switches and various things are going to be yeah. not really relevant. But you start to see the three dimensional geometry. But what I haven't done here yet, finished yet, is that you could also extract information of what the geologic structures look like from this as well. And you can also scale this up to larger scales. And uh, so things like this are going to become norm, actually. Uh, they're already developing, but they're harder. They're kind of a pain to do still. Uh, but that's where we are, right? Uh, let's see, why do I have my... Do you have a specific software that you're using? Yeah. And, uh, it's described at that website. If you want. Actually, it's not necessarily so much at the website. There are other things, but it's cool stuff. But you know, I also advise you that that software is the most ridiculously computational intensive thing I've ever worked with for years. Uh, to make that little model, it rendered it for two days, two huh? Days to run mm -hmm. on a fast computer. Mm -hmm. uh, just to render it, huh? Just, no, just to recalculate all the positions. Yeah. And the reason is it's calculating billions of trig functions over and over mm -hmm. and over again. And, uh, but it's impressive what it can do. So that's all, that's all coming. We're not quite that's there. That's the yet. intention of quantum computers, though, right? Is to, to yeah. be able to do all this well, actually, at the same if, time. If I was using even a faster computer, than I just run it on one up here that doesn't oh. use much, so it just Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can use time as fast. Yeah. If I ran it on a faster computer, it'd probably run two hours instead of two days. Okay. But that's still a long time. Yeah. Uh, and you couldn't even have done this. See, that's another reason this was never done until just the last few years, is there's no way you could have done this mm -hmm. until modern computers the last five years or so have allowed you to do this. Uh, so that'll, that's on the horizon. That's what you will see. We're going to just touch the surface of it here. Uh, what did I have here? Uh, Unfortunately, we still got to learn some topographic math. We can't run these according to rock or whatever. Uh, and so we're going to go through some other things as we go along. Now I don't have a clue what time it is. Oh, wow. Okay, I got five minutes left. Good. I was going to say we got 39 minutes of video, so. That was, I was afraid I was going to just go to. Okay, any questions, by the way? So that was just a little sales job of a little bit about where things are going, but I think it's an important thing to realize that. Geology is three-dimensional. And some of these tools can actually be extremely helpful for you. I'll try to help you with some of that as we go along. If I can build some things that are useful for you as we, as we get better at using this. This software is a pain in the butt to learn, by the way. Um, like anything, right? Good. Real topic we're going to talk now for a couple weeks is to start diving into sort of what I'd call theoretical structural geology. And I guess I went backwards there. And the first topic we're going to pick up is kinematics and strain. Because you go from geometry to the deduction of kinematics, or the motions that gave rise to the geometry and strain. That's the logical progression. And kinematics is the most uh, intuitive of the steps in understanding geologic structures. You naturally tend to quickly learn to do this in your mind in a number of different ways. So just thinking about, once you start 
thinking about geologic history and how something came from a flat layer to a fold is a kin the visualization of that in your mind is a kinematic analysis of how a layer moves to get to that particular point. But the quantification of it is not so straightforward. And it, it's strange that the quantification of it is harder than the, than the other one, which is the next step is to talk about dynamics or, or forces and the like. Um, is a little easier to understand, but it's conceptually uh, more abstract. That, that's that's long words. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> I'll get to that. <coughs> Kinematic is, you can look this up, is a description of motion without reference to the forces. And the simplest type of kinematics is things that you've already been introduced to, and that's why all of these done today, uh, is what's called rigid body motion. In a rigid body motion, what starts out as a cube stays a cube, or what starts out as a tennis ball stays a tennis ball. If you throw a tennis ball, it can translate. So it goes from point A to point B, and that's a straight line, and unless you have a skin on it or whatever. But uh, and the other, but the other component of rigid body motion is rotation. Both of these quantities are sort of up in a step ahead. The important characteristic of rigid body motion, God's name, rigid body, is that the material involved retains its shape. It's not distorted in any way. It just either moves or rotates or both. And those descriptions are both vector quantities. In fact, both of those can be described by a vector. Rigid body motion, rigid body translation is the simplest of those. I just take an object that is invisible to me, but I said I should pick up something larger. But I just simply move it from point A to point B. And that motion, every point in, in rigid body displacement, every point in that body moves with exactly the same vector. Separate, so that corner and that corner in that corner, all of the same vector that points them to the same position. This quantity, the rotation, is also a vector. For all of you that hate physics, or how many of you are still taking physics? I think it's the right time. Is rigid body rotation is a classic mechanics problem, the physics one class you have to take, right? It's described by a vector, the rotation vector. Right hand rule, remember that dreaded right hand rule? If it rotates, there's a vector that points that describes that motion, the magnitude of the vector dependent on the amount of rotation. Right? Y'all hated that, right? <laughs> that was calculus as well, right? Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Next time, we'll pick up the dreaded, go beyond that, there's yet another component of kinematics.